2021 Telehealth Summit, brought to you by the California Telehealth Resource Center. Glad you could join us for this session, the final session today uh, on business innovations. I'm Dr. Dave Boston. I am an informaticist and physician, and I will be the moderator for this session. If you've been with us all day, you've uh, been through this drill, uh, just going through some housekeeping uh, for us um, before we kick this off. We invite you to turn on your video. I think that this helps uh, provide a more interactive experience. Today's session is purely for informational purposes. The California Telehealth Resource Center has no relevant financial interest, arrangement, or affiliation with any organizations related to commercial products or services discussed during the Telehealth Summit. I'd like to go over a couple of Zoom tips. At the top right of your Zoom window, you can toggle between the speaker view, which will show you just the video of who's speaking, or the gallery view, which allows you to see all the participants with the video turned on. Closed captioning is also in, available. If you would like to view subtitles or running transcript in a separate window, you can access them via the live transcript icon on your Zoom control bar. Today's session is being recorded and will be posted on the CTRC YouTube channel next week. Lastly, please feel free to post your questions in the Zoom chat window. You can do this throughout the session and encourage um, I encourage you to do it as uh, questions come up. We'll hold the last 10 minutes of today's session to go through that Q&A. With that, I'd like you to introduce, I'd like to introduce you to our guest speakers for this session, Mohit Ghosh and Karina Mendoza from Anthem. Mohit joined Anthem Public Affairs through acquisition of Beacon Health Options in 2020. He works closely with plan presidents in California, Anthem's largest market, to deploy coordinated efforts on key public affairs, policy, regulatory, and legislative issues impacting the company and its members. Mohit has also served on the senior leadership team of Aetna and Molina Healthcare of California, where he led the government contracts team managing Medicaid, dual eligible, and exchange contracting. And he directed the company's team covering legislative, public policy, and regulatory challenges and opportunities. Mohit started his career in healthcare policy and advocacy in Washington, D.C. at America's Health Insurance Plans, where he managed media communications and served as national spokesman on industry issues over several years of legislative and policy campaigns, including the landmark Medicare prescription drug law, the generic non-discrimination law, and the mental health par parity law of 2008. Wow, he's been busy. Um, uh, Karina Mendoza is the account coordinator with the California Medicaid Strategy and Projects Division for Anthem Blue Cross. Karina has 10 years of diverse work experience in the healthcare industry, with the last four years focused on transforming the digital health experience for providers and members. Karina comes from a rural community herself and has experienced firsthand the access challenges her own community faces. In her previous position as a telehealth coordinator, she spearheaded a behavioral health specialty telehealth program for a rural healthcare district, and since has been leading multiple innovative telehealth programs in multiple counties across California for Anthem Blue Cross. Mohit and Karina, it's all yours. Thank you very much. That's very generous introductions. Um, I have to adjust my bio eventually, but uh, I know it's been a little bit since I joined Anthem at this point, uh, but I wanted to kick us off today um, while we get up our, our slides to say that, you know, Anthem has been working over the past several years to meet our customers, to meet our members where they are. Um, and coming through COVID, we've had a tremendous amount of experience uh, build up over and a, a tremendous amount of lessons learned as well over what is working and what isn't working in the realm of telehealth writ large. Um, at the start of the process, we saw a almost overnight switch. Not only did we have to uh, move all of our employees to remote work, 
uh, we also had to ensure that we were up and running with our provider partners on telehealth capabilities um, way back in March, April, and May of last year, as uh, we shut down and uh, in very many cases, were not necessarily very mobile as a society. Um, in all of that and the lessons we've learned, we've realized over the years um, that we want to be a digital first company. We want to provide access uh, for all modalities of interaction with your provider um, and, with, um, and with Anthem so that it's either in the palm of your hand, available to you at home, um, not necessarily as a primary way of receiving your healthcare, even though in some cases and in some specific conditions, that might make a lot of sense, especially in behavioral health care, where you could do appointments uh, you know, solely on telehealth, as we've seen a lot of that migration occur over the past year and a half or 18 months or so. But more importantly, in being a digital first company, we need to be able to provide access to our members in every setting that they choose to interact with. So we could use telehealth as a first line of interaction, moving on to a physical visit as needed, um, maybe doing e-consults in the future, uh, depending on the situation, and then ultimately being able to coordinate the care where it's needed as people need to maybe go in for services, uh, either in the outpatient or inpatient setting and the follow-up beyond that. So that entire spectrum, that entire, um, if you will, uh, spectrum of care and services are things that we focused on very diligently over the past three to four years. And COVID in a lot of ways uh, has pushed us to accelerate a lot of those deployments, uh, even though there were certain things happening in market, as Karina will describe, um, even prior to COVID. We just happened to be lucky that we had some of these initiatives uh, literally hitting the ground and up and running at that time. Uh, so Karina, if you wanna advance it, I just wanted to give folks a picture of where we are uh, in the state. We provide coverage for about 1.3 million people across the state of California in 29 counties. Um, you know, we are very much focused on living our mission as a company and we're focused on meeting our members where they need to be met. So as a result, what you've seen over time is that Ensuring, in order to ensure that our members get the best service for, for what they need at the right time, we also have to work very closely with our provider partners across the state to deliver those services. And what you'll see today in our presentation is, is a combination of direct to member as well as provider incentives, uh, I mean, provider innovation that we've managed to put into place over the relatively short period of time that we hope we continue to learn from, and we hope will continue to be part of the fabric of the care and services that we are able to deliver for our members in the state. So it, we have, as you can see, we have some very urban counties and we have some very rural counties. And the needs in each of those areas can be very different. There are also a lot of uh, challenges that we continue to face on culturally appropriate care as a state. And we wanna be able to address those issues of cultural appropriateness, uh, of disparities, targeting those areas, uh, as well as ensuring that we are building towards a system that is more equitable in the way it delivers healthcare for all Californians. So without further ado, I wanna hand off to Karina to get into uh, the programs that we've successfully deployed and then discuss some of the learnings from them. So Karina, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Mohit. Um, and I just want to first off by saying thank you to everyone attending the call today. Um, it's really, I know a lot of us, a lot of providers are dealing with a lot of um, different things right now with Frank. So I uh, really appreciate everyone's time today. Um, so the first program that I would like to kind of go over is um, one of our several telehealth programs that we have. It's our digital solutions kiosk program. Um, we Anthem launched this uh, transform transformative initiative um, offering our safety net providers, such as FQHCs, uh, rural health centers, and Indian health clinics, um, pre-configured um, kiosks, iPad kiosks. So uh, we've been offering an iPad Pro along with a rolling cart. Um, there's options for the rolling cart or a rolling stand. Uh, I'm sorry, a sitting top table stand. 
um, or a carrying case, depending on the use case. So these are all pre-configured with um, several different um, applications, video conferencing applications, along with uh, virtual telehealth provider apps. Um, so the ways that some of our health centers are currently using these iPads um, are for site-to-site -site telehealth. Um, so if some of our clinics are needing to, um, having a high volume day at one of their clinics, um, they could, they're using these kiosks at some of their low volume clinics for a provider to connect um, and offer that virtual visit um, at that high volume location. Um, another instance, the way this is being used is for remote telehealth. So this is allowing clinicians um, to either take the iPad home if need be um, to, per, per, to perform visits um, from their own home or um, also using these for COVID clinic days. So one of our um, FQH, large FQHCs in the Central Valley United Health Centers is using, uh, had used these for a COVID clinic day. So they had the rolling cart um, standing there with the clinician on the screen um, ready to um, see patients for, um, for that visit. And then um, this is, can also be used for specialty telehealth. As I mentioned, there's several different video conferencing applications on these iPads. So it really allows the or, um, healthcare organization to um, expand their um, offering into specialty telehealth. There's specialty telehealth groups like Clinicians Telemed or Telemed to You that are specialty groups that already have a network of specialists available for um, to assist FQHCs with credentialing them as their own and um, expanding their specialty telehealth network. And so um, we also we do have currently um, a health center that has used these kiosks for that reason. They've um, connected with clinicians telemed and implemented a specialty telehealth program and are using these for um, virtual telehealth visits in their clinic. So the clinic comes in to the or the patient comes into the clinic and um, is able to see the specialist virtually um, within that clinic. So uh, really neat to see the different ways that the kiosk has enabled providers um, and healthcare organizations to just expand access overall. overall. Um, there also, there's also Life Health Online. Um, that's an application that's uh, no cost for, to our Anthem members. Um, and it's um, virtual telehealth providers on demand, um, board certified clinicians to offer medical and behavioral health visits. So if, um, when I was, you know, with the specialty telehealth, if there's a patient that comes in and, you know, they need to see a special a psychiatrist or a psychologist and the wait is like three months out and if, and if they're an Anthem member, they can, uh, the clinic can actually schedule an appointment for that patient in the clinic um, for a behavioral health visit and they can come in and, you know, utilize this kiosk in that way as well. Um, Bright Heart Health is also another application that's installed on these iPads. Um, Bright Heart Health is a medic, it's focused, it's another behavioral health telehealth provider uh, focused on um, providing medication assisted treatment for opioid dependency. Um, so there's the physicians that are um, available through Bright Heart Health do have X waiver certification. So um, they can prescribe for the patient if needed and send that prescription over to uh, their local pharmacy in their community. So um, a lot of neat things on these iPads. Oops, sorry about that. Um, a lot of neat, neat resources. Um, through the Safari browser, there's can also has our Aunt Bertha link um, on the iPads as well for to locate um, community resources such as like food, um, jobs, housing, legal aid, um, bunch of different resources on these iPads and different uh, use cases on how they're being used out in the field. Um, another really important component of this program is Language Line. Um, Anthem has partnered with uh, Language Line uh, to offer on-demand interpretation services at no cost for Anthem members. Um, the on-demand interpretation services is able to be used with all your patients at the clinic, uh, regardless of insurance as well. So um, we're, Anthem is the first health plan to participate in a multi-payer solution like this um, and directly pay for on-demand interpretation for providers who treat our members. So the way this would work is if a patient presents at the clinic um, and they are needing an interpreter, the medical assistant can just click the language sign application 
description on here, search for the language needed. Um, there's 240 languages available through audio and 40 languages through video, uh, one of them being American Sign Language as well, and um, connect with an interpreter right during that visit. So it really saves time for the patient on um, any, um, you know, needing to reschedule an appointment because they need an interpreter there. Um, and also reduces that no-show rate, you know, if they, and cost for the interpreter time if the patient doesn't show up um, two weeks from them when they schedule that uh, visit with the interpreter. So having this on-demand solution has really been meaningful to a lot of the health centers just to have this available. Here's a testimonial from uh, Wellspace discussing how um, it just really made an impact for, for the patient that ever had this type of um, you know, on-demand service like this um, during their medical visits and um, really left, you know, the whole room in tears um, when they left, when the patient left, you know, it was just so meaningful to have um, the American Sign Language on demand like this so that the patient can communicate what's going on during um, for their healthcare needs. So this is an awesome program. Um, if, you know, anybody's interested in learning more, um, at the end of the presentation, we'll have some resources as, as far as like how to reach out and participate in this program. Um, so currently we have 350 of these kiosks deployed in our county and um, provider organizations. And we have secured um, additional iPad kiosks to deploy. So we do have some in stock. Um, and if there's any interest, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, the next program that we have is kind of like an evolution or expansion of our digital solutions kiosk program. We're calling it the remote care program. Um, we've um, partnered with Title Care to um, secure a number of medical exam kits that can be used uh, for remote care. So uh, what, we're, what Anthem is offering to our FQHCs is the kiosk equipment that I just discussed. It comes all pre-configured, same iPad, um, all pre-configured along with the Title Care, um, Title Pro Medical Exam Kit. So it has the digital camera, thermometer, stethoscope, otoscope, and tongue depressor. And this is all um, used together and in remote locations, such as we have some FQHCs wanting to use this in schools, um, out in the fields, equipping their nurses with, with this equipment to perform um, tel field telehealth visits. So to reach um, migratory seasonal farm workers and even homeless populations. So um, this is really, I'm really excited to get this program off the ground. This is like one of my babies. I'm really happy and proud of it just to kind of really excited to see what we can do in schools as well, once we get this um, launched. Our first FQHC is going live with this um, next month in the Central Valley. So we're really excited um, to get this one off the ground and what Anthem is, where Anthem is supporting um, the two-year subscription cost to the Title Care platform and providing all the equipment at no cost to the FQHCs. So really um, just a program, another program to expand access and um, can really be looked at as, you know, a revenue generator for the clinic by going out into the community and providing additional services and bringing the care to the patient. So um, here's just some examples of how the visits uh, or what kind of visits can uh, be done. So as you can see in like this picture there, this is the title home that they're using, but um, handheld camera, they're able to look inside the ear, um, do uh, use a stethoscope to listen to the heart, um, take temperatures and everything's pre-recorded in there. So uh, really it improves, you know, patient care, uh, reduces unnecessary visits to urgent care, um, improve load balancing, and improve patient satisfaction overall. You know, if we if we have this type of equipment in schools, um, really reduces uh, the burden for parents. You know, to take off time off work um, and transportation, all that stuff. So this is a really um, exciting program that um, we're really happy to offer to our providers as well. Um, next up is the our e-consult coalitions. So this is um, the Central and Central Valley e-consult coalition we started in October of last year um, and really got off the ground in January, um, starting with six FQHCs participating in um, trying to form a coalition to really build out the use of um, or expand access to specialty care. 
So e-consults are provider to provider um, communication. It's asynchronous. So what we've done is formed a coalition to engage um, several different stakeholders, managed care organizations, um, IPAs, FQHCs. It's really a community effort to uh, build e-consults into the community and have it be adopted by primary care providers. So we've built this coalition um, in conjunction with Blue Path Health, who's an e-consult consulting company to really um, get this off the ground and get e-consults used. So um, engaging uh, some of our goals and activities of the coalition include um, engaging the FQHCs, local specialists, and regional stakeholders. We hold monthly roundtables um, and also include um, the different, different e-consult vendors um, that are available. A majority of our coalition participants are utilizing Confirmed. Um, and we provide education and CME holdings as well during their roundtables. So our recent roundtables, we did a pain management CME, um, and also this month, just last week, we did a, a one focused on COVID. So this has uh, been a really meaningful program. We've just expanded into the North, actually this week, um, the eConsult Coalition. So we have 17 um, FQHCs participating in the Central Valley. And then in the north, we have 13 FQHC partners as well. So um, this has been a really meaningful program to our providers and to our members um, all around just because you know, specialty access is really heavily impacted right now, um, has been. Um, a lot of times patients are waiting three to six months to see the specialist face-to-face. -face. And, and um, I'm gonna switch over to this side, but e-consults can really um, reduce uh, unnecessary face-to-face -face visits, um, no-show rates are reduced, and the, e the way this works within the FQHC system is the patient would present at the FQHC um, needing specialty care advice. Um, the PCP then sends a specialty referral request uh, for the patient. The FQHC referral team um, kind of takes the burden off the PCP and can submit the e-consult on behalf of the PCP to the um, specialist responding to the e-consult. And then um, what we've seen 80% of the time when the e-consults are sent, um, they're closed out and handled by the PCP. So a lot of times the PCP is already on the right track um, and they're just, you know, have a quick question for the specialist. And so they're able to close out the, re the referral and um, get the advice needed from, from the specialist. So there's, that's, um, those are just a few of the programs that we currently have uh, going live. If there's any interest to participate in any of these, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, and I will hand it off to Mohit to kind of talk a little bit more about um, how these programs are impacting you know, policy advancement. So Mohit, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, thank you. And we already have some questions in the uh, chat that we'll get to in a minute. Of course, I want to be very cognizant of the fact that not everybody might have access to, you know, the service model that we are trying to push out through both our rural and urban counties across 29 counties, but we'd be happy to chat. Um, you will have contact information for both Karina and myself uh, made available to you. So sending us a note, at least to start a discussion, um, whether you're, you know, in the telehealth space yourself whether you're an FQ, whether you're a rural health clinic, um, you know, we'd be happy to at least engage and see how we can help each other. So I want to make that clear at the outset. And, you know, one of the things that you'll see in our work is that um, we recognize that a lot of the innovation still has to comply with the regulatory uh, requirements within a state. Uh, and in California, as you know, we are very progressive in how we view access and how we view equity and how we view disparities and, and the reduction of disparities. So for all those reasons, uh, when we do telehealth and we roll out innovation, we're actually trying to get ahead of the curve a little bit, number one. Number two, we're trying to build out and pay for, if you know, pay for these pilot type programs so that we can actually directly uh, take those results to the state and make the case that these are logical needed benefits and structural changes that might have to occur in California in order to enhance telehealth and deliver on the promise of multimodal care 
in this area. So, you know, that's what drives our policy positioning. That's what drives our policy focus. Um, you know, on this particular slide, you can see that we're calling out all champions. And the reason we're doing that is we need the front line to work with us on these issues. Um, I'll give you some examples that you see right here. Um, in fact, the good news about Senator Caballero's bill, first of all, she is from the Fresno, La greater Fresno area. She understands the Central Valley um, and she spearheaded a bill uh, specific to e-consults. And the reason behind that is that on, outside of the public health emergency and just in Medi-Cal payment structures in general, um, the PCP is actually not paid for performing the e-consult. So while the specialist is paid for a specialist e-consult, the PCP and the, the primary care office does not receive a payment for actually managing that patient better, if you will. So in order to build stickiness at the PCP level, in order to give people a medical home that they know and where the, the team that uh, deals with their care understands and gets the right kind of consults for them, preventing them, as Karina was saying, from the need that maybe having to travel just for a specialty consult. Uh, now, nobody's saying that you don't need to have a physical visit eventually, but if 80% of cases could be solved in the PCP setting, you're looking at everything from transportation costs to, you know, um, uh, I, I want to say quality of life issues, uh, time spent while trying to seek care, all of those things that we look at in terms of social determinants of why people don't actually get to the doctor when they need the doctor or why care is delayed or ignored. Um, those are the types of things we're trying to address when we do our policy work. So the, the bill that um, uh, in, just coincidentally passed just this afternoon out of the Assembly Appropriations Committee on I think a unanimous vote. So we're, uh, I hope I'm not misstating that, but that is exciting news, um, which will actually allow for Medi-Cal to actually pay the PCP at the FQHC level for performing that e-consult and the follow-up that goes along with it. So, you know, this is, this is stuff that we've worked on. We're proud that there are many partners, probably several people on this call <laughs> who've probably worked on this issue with us in the state. So that's some exciting news. Um, but as you can see, we need to have FQHC partners who will work with us on this. We need to ensure that there's a higher degree of provider education as we go down these different modalities and different pilots and different policy changes when it comes to um, telehealth in general. As I was mentioning in my opening, we came out of a situation where even though companies like Anthem were ready to deploy, were ready to pay for more telehealth, um, we were primarily pushed into using the larger vendors like the Live Health Onlines because there wasn't a lot of capacity for people within the localities to push into telehealth, right? But going through COVID, that's one of the major lessons learned is that the system is capable of pivoting. And we've seen that pivot occur even in local clinics where there was a, a number of changes that had to happen to still continue to provide the care that the community at large needs. So now that we've come through that crucible of COVID, not to say that there aren't you know, a lot of challenges still with the Delta variant and other things, I think that's one of the major lessons learned is that working together, providers and plans can create practice transformation that helps impact care delivery in a positive way for our, for our members and your patients in the provider community. So we're looking forward to doing more in that area. I think another piece that has really put us on a new footing when it comes to telehealth are some of the changes that have now been pushed through uh, in the trailer bill on the budget, which is AB 133, which was signed uh, just last week, uh, maybe a week and a half ago. Sorry, time's uh, getting uh, <laughs> coming into confluence for me here. There's a lot going on, as you might imagine, in California. But one of the things that we see there is that there is an emphasis on data exchange. Uh, telehealth, ultimately uh, capturing the right data, aligning programming to those that need it most, making sure that we're reaching out in the right ways. All of those things come into play when you have more money being devoted at the state level, both in Medi-Cal and outside of Medi-Cal on an infrastructure building basis. So we're, we're pretty happy to see 
that the policy direction in the state of California continues to make us a leader in driving towards better data exchange, more better telehealth interfaces, uh, more policy direction in terms of how to integrate all of these different modalities of care. Um, for example, you know, as I was saying earlier, in behavioral health, it might be pretty easy to continue to go audio only or even video, right? But in other cases, you might need to have a face-to-face -face visit once in a while to make sure that you're that you're providing the right kind of assistance for the patient uh, that you are um, helping them live a healthier life. So when you look at our virtual um, policy or our, our policy direction in either the virtual care space or the telehealth space, it really is driven by improving access, making sure that we are getting more people the types of care that they need in the right setting at the right time. It, really is about expanding the provider base that's made available. Now we recognize that there are a lot of local issues. We wanna make sure that we have more doctors of all types in all parts of California, but very often that's just simply not possible. So the extent to which that we can augment the local provider base and work with them to ensure that the services are getting to those who need it, not cannibalizing, not taking away anything, but rather adding to the system uh, and its capabilities in terms of load bearing overall, I think will go a long way. So there's more work to be done on that on the policy front. The other place of course is creating an environment where people know that they have access to care in multiple modalities. Could be as simple as something on your, on your phone uh, on your, uh, that you have, or could be something uh, like Karina has been describing with the telehealth kiosks where you're in a setting and you get services that you need immediately on demand, like the interpretation work that we've done. And then not to put too fine a point on it, but um, we can't do this without partners. And what we saw in the building of the telehealth, uh, of the e-consult coalition was that it wasn't something that we went out and said, Anthem's gonna do this and everybody get on Anthem's page. It, it just simply would not have worked appropriately that way. We went out, we learned, uh, that was key with working with Blue Path, getting into the field, understanding the pain points of the FQHC partners we were seeking, bringing on board in a friendly, what we like to call coopetition, not competition, but coopetition model, bringing on board our, our uh, colleague companies to make sure that we were trying to create a system where anyone walking into the clinic would have access to these services, not just if you were an Anthem member. So we've, we've taken our mission of improving access and delivering culturally appropriate care in California, and we've taken that through the crucible of policy into our innovation in, in telehealth. And now we recognize that even beyond what's been signed and done so far, we still have more work to do in areas like broadband. How do we make sure that the capabilities even exist? And even beyond broadband, are there other things that could help provide telehealth accessibility and ease of use in our rural areas and very often, you know, in dead zones in our urban areas. So there's a lot more work that we feel we could do. We'd like to get out on, um, out into the mo even more mobility world. Um, some of the interventions that we've discussed here, just for example, could be used with the migrant farm worker community, could be used with finding homeless people and getting them the services they need on the spot. So you can see the possibilities and the policy direction that we, we continue to take is one of friendly coopetition with our colleague organizations, serious outreach with the provider community to support us in the goals that we're taking to the state. And then these types of pilot projects that we've like the ones we've built in the Central Valley and now going North that allow us to actually develop the evidence base to then take to the state and say, this is working, will you pay for it? Because this is actually having an impact on delivering the access and the services that might be lacking in certain geographies. So that's how we view our role as Anthem is really one of, yes, we, we lead, but we need people to work with us. And we're very much looking forward to having that kind of leadership and cooperation continue into the future, because we know that people are getting more acclimated to telehealth. Again, maybe just as a first line, but 
ultimately we want to meet people where they are. We want to deliver the services that they need when they need it. And we want to do it in a way that makes them most comfortable, even as we deal with an evolving um, you know, virus at this time. So that's the general overview. I know we've, we've talked a lot and we'll get into the questions uh, as well. Um, no, uh, I see one popped up right now. No, it's not signed today, sorry. <laughs> SB365 was not signed today. I wanna to be very clear. This is just another step in the process, but the more hurdles you get through, the better we should feel that maybe there will be the final recognition um, that frontline PCPs and frontline FQHC teams um, deserve to be paid uh, for the services they perform on their end of the e-consult, not just the specialty end of the e-consult. So again, more work to be done, but you can see we're pretty passionate. Karina has been building this within uh, Anthem for several years now, and a lot of her projects, and these things don't just happen overnight. So <laughs> having, having these things come to fruition in a timely way, um, I, I view that as a great series of steps headed in the right direction. So we're, we're happy to take questions now um, and we will make sure that I scroll all the way to the top and want to make sure that we talk to the right folks here. Okay. Um, I, I think I addressed some of this in terms of telehealth programs. If you are in the telehealth space, please feel free to contact us. We'd love to talk. We don't know where you work, but we're more than willing to engage and see if you fit into our, um, our mix. Um, that's one. The second is, uh, you know, oh, actually, Karina, this is a good point to just mention if you want to take one step back uh, on the deck. Before I get into the rest of the questions, I also wanted to point out that when it comes to, you know, natural disasters like wildfires and things like that, you know, we continue to be focused on deploying these. So just again, as an example, some of the kiosks, some of the iPads, you know, they have been directly deployed. Uh, to the shelters and to uh, frontline clinics in those areas that are most impacted, just to provide some extra access to services as might be needed. So we don't want to lose the sight of that, that we are in, a, in an evolving environment, not just with respect to COVID, but also very much with respect to natural disasters and res res with respect to wildfire. So I don't know if, uh, Karina, you want to address any of the other key issues on this slide as well while I scroll through the questions. Yeah, so um, a part of our wildfire response, Anthem is offering uh, free LHO to all residents. So not just Anthem members, it's open to all residents um, impacted by the wildfires and also relaxed benefits for refills and authorizations for Anthem members. So um, that's just another key element of what we're doing to um, provide some, some relief for um, everyone impacted by the wildfires. And then we have deployed these kiosks. Um, recently, Keldor fire um, has impacted, you know, the El Dorado County and surrounding areas. Uh, we've deployed three additional iPads to their um, health, HSSA Behavioral Health Department. Um, and they are LTE. So we know that right now with the wildfires, they're kind of moving them around a lot. So um, if you're, if you're looking for where exactly this iPad kiosk is, um, you, probably, you need to contact the behavioral health department to kind of just check where, where exactly um, they have placed it at because it is getting moved around. Um, we've sent out two additional um, LTE iPads for um, the same fire, but up and we hear it's going into the South Lake Tahoe area. So they've, um, those iPads were shipped out today and should be arriving later for that area to also be covered as well, so. And then um, I think you can see that we're, these things are very fluid and you can see the contact information provided uh, for these programs right now. Um, folks should feel free to contact either for a county-based inquiry or providers who want, want to help us out with the wildfire programming that we're doing currently. Just get in touch with us if your solution works, if we are deployed in your zones, whatever it is, we'd like to be able to help. So. Um, in our obviously in those areas where we are allowed to in terms of our coverage uh, footprint. So please feel free to contact us. I will start addressing a couple more questions um, from our friends uh, who are 
I think this is the telemed for you team. Uh, again, you can contact Karina or myself uh, to just follow up, see what we might be able to do with you. Uh, I do not know whether HMSA does this in, in, um, in Hawaii. Uh, they are, you know, we are all blues companies, but we are very separate companies. So I want to make that clear. I would, I would encourage you to follow up with the provider team at HMSA uh, directly for that, answering that question. Um, next question I see is how do the PCPs who refer patients by e-consult get feedback? Uh, Karina, I'll take a crack at it and then you can jump in. Um, this is, a, as Karina mentioned, this is asynchronous. So it is not a real-time interaction. So it, there's a format, uh, you know, a common, commonly accepted format that, uh, that you fill in, you send the consult out, the consult gets reviewed, it comes back, you know, most probably within 24 to 48 hours, you are able to uh, then uh, complete the next round of discussion with your patient locally at that point. Am I getting that right, Karina? Right, the PCP submits a clinical question through, um, for example, Confirmed, their e-consult platform, and then the Specialist receives it, reviews it, and um, gets a response back to the PCP within 24 to 48 hours um, with, with their recommendations on treatment for the patient, diagnosis, et cetera. Right. And one of the other pieces that I noticed in the question is, does the patient become a, a, a patient of the specialist? Well, that depends. You know, one of the things that we've tried to do with our e-consult program is reach into the local provider community as well, meaning trying to get the local providers who are specialists onto the e-consult platform. So that is a possibility, right? So if the patient does need an in-person visit and further follow-up or inpatient or outpatient services, then that specialist um, lock-in, if you will, and connection can be made within a, a certain geography if that local specialist is indeed on the ConfirmEd platform uh, you know, with us in order to deliver these services. Um, I will also point out that, yes, the e-consult process is a learning process for everyone. And Karina, I don't know if you want to address some of the practice transformation education work that needs to happen on that front. Yeah, so um, we're currently, during our roundtables, we provide um, CME, as I mentioned, to for primary care providers to kind of listen to the different, um, recently we've been sharing different use cases like for each specialty. So we've done like a pain management CME that really um, sheds light on how um, the pain management e-consults can benefit, you know, the PCP as far as just, you know, learning how to treat that patient for, and um, adopt it as their, and the e-consult into their workflow. Um, one of the big things I would say that we've heard from the provider organizations is to just to make this as seamless as possible for the primary care providers. Um, so having you know the payer collaboration, as Mohit said, um, has really made it easy. We are looking um, to continue to provide support um, and you know have multiple you know all lines of business of Anthem um, participate any consults. Um, that's something on our radar that we're looking into doing, but. Um, yeah, just making it adoptable and easy for the PCP. I, I mean, take, doing the e-consult is an extra step. So um, ha having the referral team kind of step in and, and um, submit that e-consult on behalf of um, the PCP, just like, you know, the, typically the work, way the workflow happens is the PCP would submit um, a regular referral and just choose it as an e-consult, the referral team submits it to ConfirmEd and then they respond. And they, the referral team manages attaching any um, clinical documentation needed um, for review as well. So hopefully that kind of answers the question that was asked. And yeah, no, I mean, it is, it is pretty, uh, you have to, and that's not lost on us that a lot of this work in telehealth in general is about practice transformation is about educating people, is about giving them, you know, cheat sheets of what they need to do to accomplish some of these uh, very specific outreaches on behalf of their patients uh, when it comes to e-consult, or is about even providing instructions uh, in a very simple way 
to make sure people know what's available to them on that kiosk, um, on, you know, whether it's the language line or uh, and Bertha services, et cetera. So all of these pieces are educational items that our provider relations team and Karina's team have to deploy into the field, right? We need to, we have to work very closely with our provider partners so they know the workflows, so they understand what they're, what they're asking for and what to expect in response. And then to be able to give them the cheat sheet so that when people are in full flow of triaging patients within a clinic, they are able to actually still get uh, the answers and, and uh, services that they need. Karina, could you go one slide back? Uh, I have a question in here. Can you show the email again for telehealth programs? I think we'll actually go back to the resource page so that folks can uh, note that. And oh, okay. for, the, for the team at the resource center, I wanna say that uh, all, of these, all of these links are, are live links. So the extent to which you can get them uh, you know, posted as part of the presentation, so they're live, um, not just in the presentation itself. That would be uh, really helpful for those on the phone. Um, I, think, I think that's all the questions we had. You know, I, I wanted to uh, first encourage people to ask more questions if you have them, uh, but I did, I did also want to spend a minute just reminding people that uh, this, this work is in its infancy, right? We are just scratching the service, surface on this. Uh, we are seeing good results depending across all programs, better results in certain programs versus others. Um, I think the discussion ongoing of what we have learned from the COVID public health emergency and telehealth and uh, what works and what doesn't work will continue. Uh, I think we will also on the policy front, see a lot more work happening on the data exchange pieces on the, um, uh, the ease of use of telehealth. Uh, and then of course, on the accessibility of telehealth, uh, depending on where, um, you know, where, where we end up heading as a state, we have to be able to align it with the provider community, with the health plan community, with the counties that do a lot of behavioral health and other services. Uh, and then of course, with all of the CBOs uh, who we depend on out in the community, to be a part of, a, uh, of the fabric of delivering healthcare and uh, social determinant services in the state. Um, so thank you uh, for that. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to let, uh, of having Karina and myself uh, give yeah, you a little you. taste of, of all of the amazing work that's going on at Anthem. And of course, what we wanna do with you um, in the community at large. Thank you. I, mean, I, I, for one, am, am impressed. Um, you guys are really, you know, on the forefront. You're bending the curve. You're, you're making um, uh, some great things happen, and uh, appreciate all that. Congratulations. Love to hear um, from anyone else, uh, and invite folks to come off mute and ask a question, or you can raise your hand uh, in the little reactions section if you, um, if you would like. Um, we can uh, have you just ask a question directly. Um, while we're waiting for that, I, I have a couple questions. Um, are you able to, you, you talked about some of the benefits you're seeing already. Can you share any information like uh, claims data, something that indicate that there really has been uh, you know, decreased downstream utilization in the ER or otherwise, or is it just too, too short a time so far to, to make any um, statements to that? Yeah, for our remote care program, uh, that one's still in the early phase. So it hasn't, we haven't gone live with our FQHC quite yet. Um, next month, they're gonna start um, doing visits and we will be monitoring like the utilization at whole, at whole. So um, that one's kind of too early uh, with the e-consults. We are um, monitoring that and we're, work, we're trying to work with our um, IPA partners to kind of obtain, you know, referral data, outstanding referral data to kind of see which of our members have received any consults and um, we're able to close that referral by looking at that outstanding referral data um, so that's just one component of what we're going to be looking at. Um, but 
with our um, collaboration with Blue Path Health, they are building like community uh, wide dashboard, which will uh, be shared with DMHC. Um, it's in the process of being built and going live uh, within the coming weeks. So we'll have more to share. Um, cool. And actually in October, we're, yeah, in October, we're gonna be attending, um, well, Mohit will also be presenting uh, at the CPCA webinar uh, where it'll be just focused on the Central Valley um, e-consult coalition and talking about going a little bit deeper into all of that and sharing more data. So um, welcome everyone to look into that, that conference as well. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Sophie, you had a question. Yes, hi, I'm Sophie from Center for Care Innovations and we're together with California Healthcare Foundation looking at how can virtual care advance health equity post pandemic and a lot of the things you have talked to is directly relevant, but especially how to ensure services for people with limited English proficiency. And when we spoken to FQHCs, we're pretty surprised by how difficult they still find it to ensure uh, interpretation services, even the ones that have started work with language line. So my question is, how much technical support to ensure there's uh, integration from the provider side, that it's a one click or, or just easier access from the provider side. Are you also extending any of that support? Yeah, so we do have um, a concierge rep in each region uh, that works with our FQHCs in, the, in that region to provide support such as um, training and we've developed F, um, reference guides and for the MAs to follow as far as like how to utilize the platform. Um, so we do have that available. Um, but I mean, definitely, um, open to hear any suggestions on how we can improve that if, if, um, yeah. there is still some obstacles there. Right. And I think, you know, when we talk about that level of training, that, that again, goes back to the workflow challenge that we were all, you know, that we referred to earlier, but I think also we've done a lot of granting in this space as a company. So, um, Anthem has actually through our own foundation or through the Medi-Cal business itself, provided uh, grants to bring FQHCs to more of an up and running phase of things, depending on what technology was going to be deployed. Um, you know, for example, with the e-consult work, we've actually been paying for that e-consult at the PCP level because we wanted to see if it worked, right? So that's the innovation and in policy. We had to change our own policies to pay for this, to, to begin to build an understanding that paying for the PCP in the e-consult side of it actually makes sense. Now you've got bills like 365 that I referenced earlier that are actually taking the work that we've done and putting it on, you know, into the actual Medi-Cal benefit. So it really is that innovation that then drives the policy that then creates the benefit that we know is working. So you know, there's a pathway there that we need to continue to do more of, but it only happens if you come in with some money up front. So, you know, I'm very proud of Anthem as a company uh, for literally putting the money where our mouth is. If we want to be a digital first company, if we want to improve access, if we want to make it ease of use for the, for the provider and the consumer, you know, we've spent the last two years building out these programs, um, you know, in order to prove their work and put the money into them. And then of course it becomes to the point, you know, whether it's the California Healthcare Foundation or others, you know, we absolutely wanna partner on research opportunities that would allow us to build and make the case, even on a peer reviewed basis, that the interventions that we want to include actually make sense for the government to pay for. That's great, it's, it's so important. I mean, the PCP really, this, this is extra work for the PCP. Um, um, uh, they're, they're doing the work that historically specialists would do if they'd seen the patient directly. So um, it's very important that they get paid for that. So I appreciate all that you're doing in that direction. Um, there's another question in the chat. Uh, and either of you can speak to um, the patient's um, uh, exposure to e-consults. How do they know that an e-consult is happening on their behalf and, and how do they get the results? So um, it is provider to provider communication. So typically sometimes, I mean, it's up to the primary care provider to inform 
um, the member say, hey, we're going to, I'm going to, I have a question for the specialist. I'm going to submit an e-consult. Let's save some time. Um, instead of referring you, you might have to wait a couple weeks or a month to get in. Um, I could just submit this e-consult. So it's up to the PCP to kind of inform um, the patient that they're going to be submitting an e-consult. Uh, the response time is so quick that um, if, you know, that patient does need to be seen face-to-face, -face, they can, uh, that referral is still sent as well, you know, for that face-to-face -face visit. Um, so, so that's kind of the process. Um, and then for, as far as like, what's, how do you know what the response is for the member or the patient? Um, everything is um, captured and stored within the um, patient record. So it's typically stored within the EHR. At, at the point of service. So that, you know, all of the information comes back in that closed loop to the, the governing PCP office, if you will. And so that way the patients know in going back to their PCP, whether they, they can resolve the issue, whether they need to go on a face-to-face -face visit or whether there's another intermediate step that has been suggested and they can move into that. So it's really about maximizing the available resources at the time of service. Yeah, which is another example of, I mean, the PCP doing the work that a specialist would normally say, what I'd like you to do is A, B, and C. Right. Now the PCP has to contact the patient and say, well, I've talked to the specialist by e-consult and they would like you know you to do A, B, and C or, um, you know. Um, right, but from a, philosophical, from a philosophical policy standpoint, right, we've been in this managed care space over time for many, you know, for a few decades now. And I honestly feel, and I've been working policy issues for about 20 plus years, and I honestly feel we're finally catching up to the promise of population-based healthcare and managed care in general, because what we are able to do now is actually use the technology that has finally caught up with that promise, right? The, the origins of managed care was supposed to coordinate care, was supposed to provide case management, was supposed to make it easier for the consumer and I think over time, we've developed the systems and we've developed the data interchanges and the technologies that we are truly now at a point where we are able to deliver on that promise of truly keeping the patient at the center of everything we do. Great. Uh, Telemed to you, you have your hand up. Uh, this is the last, we're just at two minutes. So briefly, please. Yes. Um, hi. Um, thanks for the um, information. I was wondering about how your Aunt Bertha program works. Um, I'm an integrative rheumatologist, and I really try to encourage patients to get involved in their own chronic disease management through right. stress reduction and things like that. Is the Aunt Bertha resource something that the patients navigate themselves or providers do it? Is it only for patients, I would guess, in California? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that, and then Karina, you can clean me up here. Aunt Bertha is our uh, is a national vendor partner for uh, Anthem. Uh, they are actually based out of Texas, uh, and they came up as a company, if I remember correctly, that was really trying to build a more robust um, community interchange information resource. Right, so it's taking everything that used to be called two one one or whatever, and then bring it all together under one umbrella. And then over the years, you add other ancillary CBOs and other providers in the community to that same system. So it becomes more and more of a one-stop shop for the types of resources that have a very clear ability to impact the social circumstances and the social healthcare of your patient, right? So that's where we've come to Aunt Bertha being one of those resources that depending on the geography can be pretty robust. Again, I don't know how many states that they are deployed in, but we know that in California, they're at least able to help us do some of that rounding up and uh, you know, um, the creation and curation of the community-based resources that we wanna direct our members to. And, and, I, and if I recall correctly, it is member-driven, meaning we provide the access and the member can then drive into those services uh, on their own. Did I get that right, Karina? Yes, and as far as like um, the member can just access the link through their own smartphone, or we have the link also available through our iPad kiosk. So if they were in the clinic and they were needing a resource, they can go 
go through our iPad kiosk as well to access um, Aunt Bertha through the actual Kearney community resources. Is there someone to contact, a provider can contact to learn more about their resources and programs and how it works? Yeah, you can follow up with me um, offline and then we can, I can answer some more oh, of your questions. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you both. It's uh, three o'clock and I, I just wanted to express my um, appreciation for the time and effort you guys spent um, uh, uh, developing and presenting this wonderful talk. Um, and I want to thank all the participants for the wonderful discussion. There's some great back and forth stuff going on in the chat. Uh, people are engaged with each other. And um, I know I will reach out offline to both of you about some questions I had. I'd love to hear more about this eConsult coalition you've developed. Sounds wonderful. Um, so I wish all of you a, um, a wonderful Thursday evening and, and hope to see you again tomorrow.